the reality of our redemption, part three. I've chosen four texts of scripture that I believe capture the essence and the nuances of our redemption. We shall read them one by one with open hearts so as to deepen our understanding of these four texts. The first text of scripture is contained in the book of Romans. I call it the Magna Carta of our Christian liberty. It is found in Romans chapter 3 that has often been read by many with emphasis on our collective sin rather than the great deliverance Christ Jesus our Lord and Savior bought for us with his precious blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary. You know, pessimists, they will always see the wrong thing and... <laughs> But those who are now pessimists and uh, who are positive in their thinking will continue to emphasize what is more important. Yes, all men have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But that's not the final. It's a comma there, not a full stop. We are going to read it with clarity and understanding today because Jesus Christ our Lord bought for us this precious freedom and liberty from sin and the consequences of sin forever. Let's read Romans chapter 3, verse 21 to 26. It reads, and I quote, But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. I like what Jesus said. He said, the law and the prophets were until John. Bam! From that time on, the kingdom of God forcefully advances, and only the forceful can lay hold of it. Let me start reading from verse 21 again. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, been witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith, not through your works, not through the law, not through complying with codes and regulations, through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. There's no limitation here. It's not gender. It's not based on age. To all and all who believe. Your background does not matter. If you believe, you receive this package of redemption. For there is no difference. All, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Comma. Can you see comma in your Bible? Stop there. Comma. Many people will put full stop there. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. As if that's the end of the message. No, there is a comma there. Go on and complete the sentence. Being justified. Just as if you have never sinned. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption of that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God had passed over. Just as death passed over the people in Egypt during Passover time, God has passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. What does this mean? That he might be just? Because if God does not punish sin, then he's unjust. But what did he do? He took the sin upon himself. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. All the ordinances against us were nailed at his cross forever so that we can be free. So stop reading for all I've seen and come short of the glory of God. Come on. Remember there's a comma there. Read the complete thing of what Christ purchased for us on the cross of Calvary. The second text of scripture is located in Ephesians chapter 1 and it carries the great benefits of our redemption in addition to forgiveness of and the cleansing from our sins. Please listen attentively as I read and pay attention to the highlights because I will, I will highlight some. It reads and I quote Ephesians 1, 3 to 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him. When? Before the foundation of the world. Many people think redemption started after Christ died. No, the Lamb of God was slain from before the foundation of the earth. God bought us back before we fell. Before mankind fell. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy. He chose us that we should be holy and without blame, before him in love. Do you, can you imagine the love of God having predestined us before you were born, before I was born, before we were formed in our mother's womb, he had predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself 
according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him, in Christ Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance. See, this is part of the package of redemption. We have an inheritance. You don't labor for inheritance. It's bestowed upon you. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. That we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. That men should see us and glorify God in us. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed by God. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Don't, don't tamper with that seal. You remember if you go to the pharmacy, they say if the seal is broken, don't use it. You are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Who is the guarantee, the, the, the down payment, the guarantee of our inheritance? If you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, it means you have that down payment and you can draw down from all the resources in heaven as you will find out because we are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places and the down payment of that is the Holy Spirit in you. It's not just to talk in tongues, it's to be able to explore the things of God and pull from the well of salvation joy inexpressible. Two is a guarantee of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. The third text of scripture is found in the book of Colossians and that contains the legal aspect of our redemption and reconciliation by Christ Jesus the Lord. Colossians 1 verse 12 to 23. Given thanks to the Father who has qualified us, we do not qualify, but he qualified us, who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light, not the saints in the dark. Many people are born again, but they are as blind as bat. This is why Paul prayed that the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened, because there is inheritance for saints in the light. He has delivered us, not about to do so, not if we do it. He has delivered us, past tense, from the power of darkness and conveyed or translated us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption. How? Through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Can you please become righteousness conscious for a change? And not be sin bound, always confessing sin every morning, every morning. Without God has forgiven and forgotten. You go back there and fish it up again. He, Jesus Christ, is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created. Wow. That are in heaven and that on earth. He is the word from the beginning. He created everything. There is nothing that is made that was not made by him. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. Any of them that rises against him, he will nullify and knock down. Ask Lucifer. He was knocked out with a third of angelic hosts with him. Pshum, in a swoop, Jesus said, I saw Satan fall as lightning from heaven. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Where God cannot rule, he will overrule. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. And by him to reconcile, that's why I say for our redemption and reconciliation, we are no longer at, at war with God. God is no longer looking at us as enemies and we don't see him as our enemy. By him to reconcile all things to himself, by him whether things on earth or things in heaven, have made peace through the blood of his cross. And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death 
to present you. This is, this is the end product. To present you holy and blameless. Do you think God is, 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 is feeble? He cannot fulfill his word. We are moving towards perfection. We will get there. We are work in progress. It does not matter what stumbling blocks and how we fall and rise. It does not matter because at the end of the day, by special grace, he will present us holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. If indeed you continue in the faith, that's the responsible part, the responsibility part of this message, the vital part of our redemption. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, I can as well put my name there, Trinity Bakari became a minister. Because what is good for the goose is good for the gander. Paul was used so that we can learn from him, of which I, Paul, became a minister. The fourth and final text of scripture for today's message is located in the book of 1 Peter, and Peter should know about this because he stumbled many times while following Jesus, but he never failed to follow. And grace sustained him until he could stand. Even after he had preached the gospel powerfully on the day of Pentecost, he still had to be rebuked by Paul, who was saved long after he had been with Paul, Peter had been with Christ, he was rebuked for playing a hypocritical game with, with the Gentiles when Jews showed up. You, we are not perfect, but we are moving towards perfection. Do not rejoice over me, my enemy. I thank you, Lord, for that word. For if I fall, I will rise again. The righteous man falleth seven times. Seven is the number of perfection. That's what he's saying there. He's falling and rising so that he will learn how to stand perfect and strong before God. First Peter chapter 1, verse 3 to 9. And then I will read that into 21. And this is the vital aspect of our redemption, where our responsibility comes in for what we have received without any work legally. The legal aspect of our redemption, it was done for us. God qualified us, but we have to now maintain what we have obtained. How do we do it? First Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy, has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Why various trials? No test, no testimonial, no battle, no victory, no cross, no crown. You are being tested by various trials that the genuineness of your faith be much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom have, have not seen you, Lord, though now you do not see him yet believing, you rejoice with joy, inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your soul. The moment you exercise your faith in God and in the complete work of Christ on a Calvary, the moment you receive him and ask him to forgive you and you receive him as Lord and Savior, your sins are washed away, you are cleansed by the blood, then you have responsibility to maintain what you have obtained. That's why it says, walk out, walk out. He's already walked in you. Now walk out your salvation with fear and trembling, fear of God. Now here is a balance, verse 13 to 21, 1 Peter chapter 1. Therefore, guard up the loins of your mind. Don't allow the enemy to land on your head and suggest things to you. A bird may fly over your head. Temptations may come in different forms and shape. But don't allow the bird to build a nest there. Cast them down, every high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of Christ. Therefore, get up the loins of your mind. Be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's not about his second coming, but when it's revealed in you, like Paul said, when he pleased God in Galatians chapter 1, he said, when he pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb to reveal his son in me. That's the revelation he's talking about. Christ in you, the hope of glory. As obedient children, not conforming yourself to the former laws, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, 
you also be holy in all your conduct because it is written, be holy for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourself throughout the time of your stay here in fear. That's not morbid fear. That's not fear that torments. In the fear of God that he sees all things, he judges all things, and he will reward every man according to his work. Knowing that you are not redeemed, underline, you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold. It's not the donation you brought to church that saved you. It's not the, uh, the, 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 the pews that you bought and that you put your name on so that you can sit on it and your family. That's not what saved you. It is not the grand piano that you bought. No, you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot. And I'm coming back there today, without blemish, without spot. If there's a single blemish on it, that will not be acceptable to God. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world. <laughs> Satan just fell, fell in, into, into a setup. It was set up and he fell for it and he ruined himself forever and ever. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God, not in what the economics say, uh, economics say, such as parables, all things. No, 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 no. Your faith and hope will rest in God Almighty. With this scriptural foundation, let us now proceed to define the word redemption. I waited patiently until this third part to define redemption to you because I don't know what you really believe redemption is all about. The simple dictionary definition of redemption is in two parts. One, redemption means the action of saving or being saved from sin. Google generation, you can Google, you will see there. The action of saving or being saved from sin, error, or evil as in God's plan for the redemption of mankind. And number two, the action of regaining or gaining possession of something in exchange for payment or clearing of debt. The action of regaining or gaining possession of something in exchange for payment or clearing of debt. The biblical definition of redemption is much deeper than the dictionary definition and it is in three parts. One, redemption from the standpoint of the Bible simply means to buy again something that has been sold by paying back the price to him that bought it. Many of my fathers, I'm talking of my natural father, many of his farmlands were sold at his death and people bought them but my mother showed me those things and we bought them back from those who bought them. We bought them back. That's redemption. We bought them back from them so that they can be kept and his heritage will remain intact. To buy against something that has been sold by paying back the price to him that bought it. Lift chapter 25, verse 25 to 27. Lift chapter 25, 25 to 27. If one of your brethren becomes poor and has sold some of his possession, and if his redeeming relative comes to redeem it, then he may redeem what his brother sold. Mm. Adam was son of God. You read it in Matthew, the genealogy of Jesus. Adam, the son of God, sold us to slavery, to sin, and, and, and through the deception of the devil. But the last Adam, Jesus Christ, came to buy us back. Or if the man has no one to redeem it, but he himself becomes able to redeem it, then let him count the year since it is its sale and restore the remainder to the man to whom he sold it, that he may return to his possession. In this connection, I remember the true story I read many years ago in a book. In that story, a young boy built himself a small raffia boat with his initials firmly fixed on it. Just like if it was me, I will put GBB. He put his initials on this raffia boat. One day, he took a small boat to the beach, and while playing with it, the sea wave carried the boat away. He cried, he wept, nothing came back. 
He waited for long. Nothing came back. He left the sea and went back home. Very sorrowful. But many years later, the raffia boat was found by its builder. The same boy who has now become a young man, he found the boat in an antique shop. The young man looked at it closely and found its initials still intact on the raffia boat. He asked the owner of the shop how he came about it or how he came by it. The shop owner said it was sold to him by someone. Someone found that boat and sold it to the antique dealer. The young man quickly opened his wallet, counted the new selling price to the owner of the shop, and after the search, he said, this raffia boat is mine. I built it and fixed my signature on it. It was lost and sold, but now I bought it back. The Lord Jesus who created mankind came. He said that we were sold completely. This is the story of our redemption. Let us make man in our image and after our likeness. God put the stamp of his initials upon us. But sin came and deformed us. But Jesus could still recognize that signature. He became one with us. He identified with us. The son of God became the son of man so that the sons of men can become the sons of God. That is redemption. Brothers and sisters, the story of this little boy is akin to our redemption story. In Psalm 100, verse 1 to 3, we know who made us. It says, make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. A self-made man is a disaster going somewhere to happen. God made us. Now, as I said, Adam and Eve, through deception, betrayed God and sold us to Satan. The last Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Passover lamb, bought us back with his precious blood. Therefore, all believers can confidently say today that we are already bought back by the Lord. Therefore, we are no longer for sale. Hallelujah. I want you to say that confidently. The Lord Jesus had bought me back. I'm no longer for sale. I hear people say, every man has a price. Every man has a price. Yes, every man has, but exagorazo, an excessive price that cannot be matched by anybody else, had been paid for us on the cross of Calvary. The biblical story of prophet Uzziah and Goma <laughs> illustrates this message perfectly. I want you to pay attention. I don't know what you would do if you are prophet Uzziah. A young prophet standing before God and praying and for, for God's intervention in the affairs of his, of his nation. Suddenly, God spoke to him to go marry a prostitute. <laughs> if you were Hosea, you would rebuke the devil instantly and say, How can I, a prophet of God, marry a prostitute? But it was an illustrated sermon. Give me Hosea chapter 1, verse 1 to 11. The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, the son of Barry. In the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Ezekiah. Look, those are four kings. This prophet ministered in the reign of those four kings. Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Ezekiah, kings of Judah. And in the days of Jero Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. When the Lord began to speak by Uzziah, the Lord said to Uzziah, Go take yourself a wife of hollow tree. And children of our Lord. Now don't hear this today and say God has spoken to you. Let him be the one speaking to you. Just don't say, because your name is not Hosea to start with. And let God deal with everyone. I'm just using this to illustrate the message of our redemption. Go take yourself a wife of halotry and children of halotry, for the land has committed great halotry by departing from the Lord. So he went and took Goma, the daughter of Dibli. And she conceived and bore him a son. Then the Lord said to him, call his name Jezreel. For in a little while I will avenge the bloodshed of Jezreel on the house of Jehu and bring an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. It shall come to pass in that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. And she conceived again and bore a daughter. Then God said to him, call her name, Lord Ohama, for I will no longer have mercy on the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. Yet I will have mercy on the house of Judah, 
We save them by the Lord their God, and we not save them by bow, nor by sword or battle, by horses or horsemen. Now, when she had win Loruhama, she conceived and bore a son. This is the third child. Then God said, Call his name Loami, for you are not my people, and I will not be your God. Illustrated Salmon. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea. We cannot be measured or numbered, and it shall come to pass. In the place where it was said to them, You are not my people. There it shall be said to them, You are sons of the living God. God will take them through process that everyone looking at them will be able to see clearly the image of God upon them. Then the children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together and appoint themselves one head, and they shall come up out of the land, for great will be the day of Jezreel. Now, if you are following this story, you will say, where is redemption in this? No, it's not just what happened to the sons and daughters that were born, as illustrated message to the children of Israel and Judah. It is what happened between uh, the prophet Uzziah and Goma, his wife, that he had married and had three children for him. Two boys and a girl. A boy, a girl, and a boy. Now, what happened to Goma? Goma went back into prostitution. Went back to sleep around again. Wow. Hosea chapter 3, verse 1 to 5. Then the Lord said to me, go again. Love a woman who is loved by a lover. He's the same person and is committing adultery. Just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel who look to other girls and love the raising cakes of the pagans. So I bought her. Redemption. I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver and one and one half omers of barley. So, and I said to her, you shall stay with me many days. You shall not play the harlot, nor shall you have a man. So too will I be toward you. For the children of Israel shall abide many days without king or priest, without sacrifice or sacred pillar, without effort or teraphim. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. How many men can do this except grace is involved? You married a woman, she had three children for you, then the woman stepped out into adultery and was sleeping around and goes, hey, go pay for her again. And I paid for her. That's redemption. That's what happened to us. We were lost to sin. Satan took us away from God and turned us against God. But God came in human flesh and paid the price. He tempted Jesus several times, but he could not overcome him. He settled all the temptation with it is written. And he overcame, returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. He went about doing good and healing all those who are oppressed of the devil. For God is with him. The same God has sent me to you today to preach this message of redemption. And as you receive Jesus into your life and your home, he will buy you back also as he bought me back September 24, 1974. The second biblical definition of redemption. Number two, to deliver and bring out of bondage those who are kept prisoners by their enemies. It's one thing to pay the price. It's another thing to bring you out of bondage completely. To deliver and bring out of bondage those who are kept prisoners by their enemies. Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 1 to 8. Deuteronomy 7, 1 to 8. When the Lord your God brings you into the land which you go to possess and has cast out many nations before you, the Hittites, the Gagashites, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than you. And when the Lord your God delivers them over to you, you shall conquer them and utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them, nor show mercy to them. Nor shall you make marriages with them, you shall not give your daughter to their son, nor take their daughter for your son. For they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. So the anger of the Lord will be aroused against you and destroy you suddenly. But thus you shall deal with them. You shall destroy their altars, break down their sacred pillars, cut down their wooden images, and burn their carved images with fire. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on, your, on you 
Now choose you because you are more in number, not because you're smarter, you're cleverer, you're taller, you're more handsome, you're more beautiful. No, the Lord did not set his love on you. Now choose you because you are more in number than any other people, for you are the least of all peoples. But because the Lord loves you, and because he will keep oath which is what your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you. That's the word there. Redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Redemption to deliver and bring out of bondage those who are kept prisoners by their enemies. Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 1 to 6. I want to emphasize this and I want you to, we to hear it again and again. Give here, O heavens, and I will speak. And hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. Let my teaching drop as the rain. My speed distill as the dew, as rain drops on the tender harp, and as showers on the grass. For I proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe great, greatness to our God. He is a rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are justice. A God of truth and without injustice. Righteous and upright is he. They have corrupted themselves. Uh oh, They are not his children because of their blemish. A perverse and crooked generation. Do you thus deal with the Lord, O foolish and unwise people? Is he not your father who bought you? Who bought you? Has he not made you and established you? He bought you. He bought you. But why did he buy you? Not so that you remain in bondage with blemish, so that you become holy and acceptable in his sight. Give me uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 67 to 65. He bought us. Now his father Zacharias, that's the father of John the Baptist, his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. Underline it. He has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Why? As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, who, has, who, have been, who have been since the world began, that we should be saved, saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which is swore to our father Abraham, to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, must serve him without fear. That's the purpose of redemption. In holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And let's, let's crown that with Titus chapter 2, verse 11 to 14. This is so rich and beautiful. It's Titus 2, 11. For the grace of God, that's Jesus personified. Grace personified in Jesus Christ. He is the personification of grace. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly laws, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us. Why? That he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. The third aspect of biblical definition of redemption relates to time. To redeem time is to embrace and improve every opportunity of doing good. See, God says in Joel, I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten. To redeem time is to embrace and improve every opportunity of doing good. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 to 16. Ephesians 5, 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. The time you do not subject or use for uh, purposes of the kingdom will constitute your evil days, redeeming the time because the days are evil. And Colossians chapter 4 verse 5, walk in wisdom to those who are outside, Unbelievers, those who are not born again, walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. As I prepare for this message and pondered upon the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus Christ for mankind, the story of Barabbas, the notorious rebel, robber, murderer, 
and prisoner came to my mind. Barabbas was a prisoner. He was a rebel. He was a robber. He was a murderer. What, what else are you looking for if you are looking for personification of evil? He was a rebel, a robber, a murderer, and a prisoner. As stated in the Bible, Barabbas was released by Pilate from the consequences of his crime and atrocities and to fully pay for the crime and atrocities of Barabbas, the sinless Christ in whom no fault was found was handed over by the same Pilate to be crucified instead. An exchange took place that day. Matthew chapter 27, 15 to 26. Matthew 27, I want you to understand the message of redemption. And not be shaken in your heart by circumstances or everything that confronts you. Trial, temptation, you are an overcomer. Through him, who won that trophy of grace and put it as a crown over your head and my head. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to releasing to the multitude one prisoner whom they wished. If you look at the heading of this story, it says, taking the place of Barabbas. Taking the place of Barabbas. Christ took our place on the cross. And at that time, they had a notorious prisoner. Underline, I told you it was a prisoner. I will show you all the qualifications. Rebel, prisoner, murderer, and robber. And at that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, Who do you want me to release to you? Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that they had handed him over because of envy. How many people are against you today because they are envious of you? While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent to him saying, Have nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, what then shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said to him, let him be crucified. <laughs> then the governor said, why? What evil has he done? But he cried out all the more saying, let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a torment was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and our children. Thank God the blood of Jesus speaks better things than the blood of Abel. They did not know what they were bringing upon themselves that day. Then he released Barabbas to them. And then he, when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Ha! A proper Yoruba song is welling up in my spirit right now. And I want you to understand this. Barabbas, a rebel, a murderer, a prisoner, a robber, was released while he was walking away that day in his newfound freedom. He looked back and an innocent man was being nailed to the cross instead of him. Oh, I'm going back to my Anglican days. I was raised in an Anglican school. The song goes this way. Iku ro tim baku. Iyashe timbaje ngogore lo ti kolo Jesu oluwa o ma se o tori mi lo se jia o iku oro timbako Iyashe timbaje ngogore lo ti kolo Jesu oluwa o ma se o Tori mi lo se jia, tori mi lo se jia o, tori mi lo se jia. Iku ro tim baku, iya se tim baje. Bobo re lo ti kolo, Jesu oluwa o mase o, tori mi lo se jia. I hope you are singing that in your home. That will be the song in the heart of Barabbas that day. That a sorrowful, agonizing death, he would have died. Jesus took his place on the cross. Hallelujah. Let's read the same story. In Mark chapter 15, I have another song. A Yoruba song I will interpret for you. Mark chapter 15, same story. 
6 to 15. Now at the feast, it was accustomed to releasing one prisoner to them, underline prisoner, whomever they requested. And there was one named Barabbas who was chained. That's where I'm coming. He was not just a prisoner. He was a chained prisoner <laughs> who was chained with his fellow rebels. They had committed murder in the rebellion. Then the multitude crying aloud began to ask him to do just as he had always done for them. But Pilate answered them saying, do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priest had handed him over because of envy. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd so that he should rather release Barabbas to them. Pilate answered and said to them again, what then do you want me to do with him whom you call the king of the Jews? So they cried out again, crucify him. Then Pilate said to them, why, what evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them, and he delivered Jesus after he had scourged him to be crucified. Verse number seven there is very critical. He was a prisoner that was chained. And there was one named Barabbas who was chained with his fellow rebels. They had committed murder. He was a murderer in the rebellion. What song is welling up in my spirit? Jesuja. Sheke, sheke, myo. Oku, o. Somi, dalaye. Ejere. Iye, biye. Lo, fi, rami, pa, dao. Jesuja, o. Jesuja. Sheke, sheke, myo. Oku, o. Somi, dalaye. Ejere. Iye biye o lo fira mi pada Jesu ja o Jesu ja Sheke sheke mi Oku o Samina la ye o Enjere Iye biye Lo fira mi pada Ide mi ja o Alleluia modele yo Ide mi ja o that will be your portion today in the name of Jesus. Every chain that is binding you in Jesus' name is broken. The chain is broken so that you can be free because of the redemption Jesus bought for us. Hallelujah. Luke chapter 23, 13 to 25, you can write that down. The Bible says, the man without fault was crucified so that the man with all faults will be released. I like to read it. I, I wanted to save time, but I like to read this. Luke 23, 13 to 25. And Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests, the rulers and the people, said to them, you have brought this man to me as one who misleads the people. And indeed, having examined him in your presence, Pilate did not know what he was doing here in the, in the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant uh, of Levitical priesthood, the lamb or the goat that will be a scapegoat to carry the sin of the people away must be examined. No, uh, the one that will be slaughtered must be examined that there's no flood and blemish. He was examining the Lamb of God. He didn't realize what he was doing. And indeed, having examined him in your presence, I have found no fault in this man concerning those things of which you accuse him. No, neither did Herod, for I sent you back to him. And indeed, nothing the servant of death has been done by him. I will therefore chastise him and release him. For it was necessary for him to release one to them at the feast. And they all cried out at once, saying, Away with this man and release to us Barabbas, who had been thrown into prison for a certain rebellion. He was a rebel made in the city and for murder. Stop there, that's fine. A man without fault was crucified so that the man with all faults, that's me, that's you, so that we could be released. We don't know the price that was paid on the cross. That was the exchange that took place at Calvary. The man without fault 
was crucified so that you and I, with all our faults, could become free to worship God again. Do you know that Barabbas was a robber? He was not just a murderer, a rebel, a prisoner. He was a robber. John chapter 18, verses 39 and 40. John 18, 39 and 40. But you have a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. Do you therefore want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Then they all cried again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Someone was talking to me a few days ago, and he said one of the governors presently in one of the eastern states, I will not mention name, was formerly a robber. And I said then it was a Barabbas. <laughs> there is hope for every robber in this wicked world, whether armed or paying robbers in government circles, where they sign checks and, and steal from treasury, whether they are paying robbers or armed robbers, there is hope for you if you will simply pray the simple prayer of repentance, just like the thief on the cross with Jesus Christ right now. That thief turned to Jesus and said, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. And he said to him, tonight, you'll be with me in paradise. It doesn't matter what you have done before, even if you are a Boko Haramite or whatever, Lower down your guns and turn to Jesus. He will not only forgive you, he will cleanse you from all sins and you will become a useful citizen contributing your quota like the governor that was mentioned to me. What is so intriguing to me as I read this account of Jesus taking the place of Barabbas is that God long ago wrote the script that was fulfilled that day by all the people that took part in the story. They didn't know that they were just acting out what God had written long before the event. Acts 22, Acts chapter 2, I beg your pardon. Acts 2, 22 to 24. Men of Israel hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, of Nazareth, a man has stated by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourself also know, him being delivered. How was he delivered? By the determined purpose and for knowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. Whom God raised up, having lose the pains of death, because it was not possible that you be held by it. Acts 4, 27 to 28. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Nothing happens to a child of God except he's directed or permitted by God. But death could not hold him captive. They didn't know it was a, it was a setup. He had opportunity to go down into the Hades and he took the keys of hell from hell and took the keys of death from death to set us free from the fear of death forever. Hallelujah. Indeed, known to God from eternity are all his works. Acts 17, 18. Known to God from eternity are all his works. If indeed an exchange took place that day for Barabbas to be free and Jesus to carry out his substitutionary sacrifice on the cross of Calvary, why are we still in chains of affliction, of sicknesses, of diseases, of lack and of poverty? Did not the Bible state that Jesus was manifested to destroy the works of the devil? Have you read that in your Bible? Why is the devil then still roaming about our streets and neighborhood, wrecking havoc everywhere? Why is there Boko Haram in the Northeast destroying lives? Why are there insurgents and all kinds of, of, of evil in Kaduna State killing and maiming people, attacking Christians, Muslims, and indigents and non indigents What is wrong? Brothers and sisters, it is true that Jesus was manifested to take away our sins and to destroy the works of the devil. The Bible states so, and this is true as far as the legal aspect of our redemption is concerned. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 to 8. It did not only manifest to destroy the works of the devil. It first, the first thing it did is to take away our sins. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when it's revealed in us, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who has this hope in Him 
purifies himself just as he is pure. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that it was manifested. Here is the first time you see that manifestation again. Here it was manifested to take away our sins. This came before the second one, before it destroyed the works of the devil. It manifested to take away our sin, and in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has never seen him, nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who sins of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Let me explain that to you. If, when he, if the first part of that truth is not ingrained in you, the second part cannot be fulfilled. It was manifested to take away our sins. It's when you have received that. Then it was manifested to destroy the works of the devil. It will grant you grace to trample upon serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy and nothing shall by enemies hurt you. Now, in line with the vital aspect of our redemption, you and I as believers are responsible for keeping ourselves, for keeping ourselves in such a way as to prevent the enemy from touching us. 1 John chapter 5, verse 18. 1 John 5, 18. We know that whoever is born of God does not sin, but he who has been born of God keeps himself. Responsibility is on you. Keeps himself. And the wicked one does not touch him. What then happens to a believer who dwells carelessly and keeps himself not? The devil has free access to torment and afflict him. In part two of this message, I shared with you four ways the enemy gains access into the life and homestead of believers to afflict and torment them. These four ways are, number one, ignorance of the word of God and disobedience to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Number two, disobedience to the law of spiritual jurisdiction. If you, in case you are joining us for the first time and you are not there, I will take one and two again. Number one way Satan accesses your homestead and your life and your business, ignorance of the word of God and disobedience to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Number two, disobedience to the law of spiritual jurisdiction. Number three, wrong attitudes that affect the altitudes of the believer in question. And number four, the works of the flesh. In this third part, I would like to add four more ways the enemy can gain access into a believer's life and homestead so that you can learn how to sit and prove your life and your home. The four remaining ways are failing to stand. That would be number five. Failing to stand. From my study of the Word of God and the understanding gleaned from Scripture, part of the responsibility of leadership in the church is to give meaning to the Word of God so that God's people can take a stand. Follow me into the Open Square Conference in the month of October at the Watergate in the days of Nehemiah the butler who became the governor of Judah. Nehemiah chapter 7, verse 73. And I'll read through Nehemiah 8, 1 to 10. Nehemiah 7, 73, and then 8, 1 to 10. So the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, and some of the people, the Nethanim, and all Israel dwell in their cities. When the seventh, the seventh month is the ecclesiastical month, uh, uh, of the Bible is the month October. It, when the seventh month came, the children of Israel were in their cities. Chapter 8. Now all the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gate and they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses which the Lord commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men and women and all who could hear with understanding on the first day, first of October, of the seventh month. Then he read from it in the open square that was in front of the water gate from morning until midday. Aha, uh -huh. some would say, oh, they're spending a long time. Just reading the word took about how many hours from morning until midday before the men and women and those who could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. So Ezra describes, stood on a platform if you read that in King James Version, it says he stood on a pulpit. Some people think they have pulpit ministry. Uh -uh. A platform that a short man stands upon so that people could see him. So Ezra, the scribe, stood on a platform of wood which he had made for the purpose, and beside him 
at his right hand stood Mattitiah, Shema, Ananiah, Urijah, all those names go on, all of them. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all of the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. Then all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shabbatiah, and all those names help the people. Help the people to understand the law. And the people stood in their place. When you read that in the King James Version, he said, they took a stand. So they read distinctly from the book in the law of God and they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. The responsibility of leadership in the church is to give meaning to the word of God that will preach so that people will take a stand. This ability to stand or take a stand is very essential in spiritual warfare. Failure to stand will give way to the devil. We must take a stand against him in order to properly resist him because he's an outlaw who breaks the law and functions as he wills until someone exercises authority over him. Dear friends, it's not only important to have the knowledge of God's word, we must also consciously and aggressively act upon that knowledge to resist and refuse Satan any room to operate in our lives. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 to 20. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. Failure to stand will give him access inroad into your life and to your home and to your family. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wild schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. You can stop there. If you, are, if you fail to stand, the, you cannot resist the devil. You must take up the serpent. This sign shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. They shall take up serpents. Take up serpent does not mean you become a snake charmer. You'll be able to take him up and say, I say to you, it is written. And it's when you resist him that will flee from you. First Peter chapter 5, 8 to 9. Be sober. Be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a running lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him. That's taking a stand. Steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Number six. Failure to take a stand is number five. Number six is fear. The Bible declares in 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, that fear has torment. He who fears has not been made perfect in love. Fear has torment. There is no fear in love. The perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. You don't allow fear to torment you. When the believer succumbs to the force of fear, he most definitely lowers his altitude within the firing range of the enemy. It's like your plane coming down so that the enemy could shoot at it. But if you are maintaining high altitude, far into the sky, no matter who is trying to shoot at you, you're gone. Brothers and sisters, Satan uses fear to hold men and women in bondage. It can be fear of height, fear of water, and fear of everything. The moment you harbor that fear, you open yourself to the enemy. It could even be fear of darkness when there's no light. You don't have to fear in the midst of darkness because you are light of the world. Hebrews chapter 2 verses 14 and 15. In as much then as the children are partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Before you travel, you are afraid you could, the plane could crash. Before you enter a vehicle, you are afraid. You are praying every second. No, drive away that fear 
He that keeps Israel does not sleep nor slumber. The Lord will protect you. You're going out and you're going in. You're coming in. You will go out and come in and you find pasture. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray today that the bondage of fear and the fear that is holding you captive will be broken in your life in the name of Jesus Christ. Number seven, unforgiveness. This is critical. I'm going to spend quality time on this because this is the, 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 the pit that many believers had fallen into, opening the door of their lives and homes and family for the enemy to come and torment and afflict them. Unforgiveness. Jesus, our Lord and Savior, makes it plain in the parable of the unforgiven servant what unforgiveness does and can do to the believer. Matthew chapter 18, verse 21 to 35. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Wow. In one day, you forgive a man 70 times seven. In fact, then you have become a forgiver more or less yourself. Whosoever sin you retain, we retain in heaven. Whosoever sin you, <laughs> you forgive is forgiven in heaven. If a person sins against you 400 90 or 40 times, 70 times, seven times, that's 490 times in one day. And you keep on forgiving him, you would have learned how to forgive completely and not be tormented by unforgiving spirit. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Wow, you can put $10 million there if, if you like, just to illustrate this message. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he heard, and that payment be made. The servant devil fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion. This is what happened to Jesus. Released him and forgave him the debt. Ten million dollars written off. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred dollars. <laughs> Hold him a hundred dollars. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down just as he did before his master. Fell down at his feet and begged him saying, Have patience with me and I will pay you all. And he would not. But went and threw him into prison till he will pay the debt. How would he pay it when you throw him into prison? He can't work. The system, the government will have to be feeding him there. So when his fellow servant saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have a hard compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until you pay all that was due to him. So my heavenly father also will do to you if each of you from his heart, from his heart, does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Wow. Every time I read that story, there were conflicts in my spirit. I tried to resolve it. Number one, two people ended up in prison. The man who had, was forgiven before but who did not forgive a fellow servant was back in prison. And the man who owed hundred dollars that he could not pay is in prison. And I did not see the Lord set the man with hundred dollars free. He said, okay, I set you free because <laughs> he was not the one who put him in prison. It was his fellow servant who put him in prison. So you have two people in prison under torture. For a very long time, I had serious conflict in my mind about this passage of the scripture. I could not reconcile how a loving father would deliver his own son to the devil. But when I realized the truth of the law of spiritual jurisdiction, I understood what really took place in that story. Let me explain this to you. Whenever we are in blatant, unconscious rebellion to a commandment as important as the law of forgiveness, then through that act of disobedience, we place ourselves in the enemy's territory of oppression. For example, if I have a guest or family member in my house who has committed a crime, when the police come into my house to ask for the person, I'm bound by law to deliver him or her to the police. 
or else I'll become an accomplice. In like manner, if you refuse to give those, to forgive those who offend us, when Satan comes to attack us, God is obligated by the spiritual law set in motion by him to deliver us to the enemy's demands. I hope that is very clear to everyone hearing me today that the parable of the unforgiven servant in Matthew 18, 23 to 35 just read is not a matter of God punishing us. No, God does not need the help of the devil to teach us lessons. It's a matter of God himself having to comply with the spiritual laws that he has established. Though they were established for our protection, they were established to protect us. When we break them, they result in negative consequences to our detriment. Mark chapter 11, 22 to 26. Mark 11, 22 to 26. So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt, you have fear, you have faith, not fear, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Oh, how long have you been saying? So I say to the mountain, move, and nothing is moving. You'll find out why. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Example, the citadel is standing there right now in the name of Jesus, regardless of COVID, regardless of circumstances, regardless of the economy, because people release their faith in the ability of God to make impossible possible. But here is a condition. Whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. You're not perfect. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Add to that 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. If you don't want Satan to take advantage of you, even before people realize they have sinned against you, once you know, release them. It's an enlightened self-interest to forgive people who abuse you, who blatantly misrepresent you, who tear you in their confidential whispers down. Forgive them, release them, let them go. Don't get back into prison. 2 Corinthians 2, 10 and 11. Now whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For indeed, I have forgiven anything. If indeed I've forgiven anything, I've forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ. I do it with the ability of Christ. I do it the way Christ did it. I do it the way Stephen the matter did it. Let, do not count it, donate to their charge, Lord, Stephen said. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. I'm not going to prison with anyone. God has set me free. I'm standing firm in the liberty with which Christ has set me free. If you have forgiven anyone, I've forgiven in the person of Christ. Lest Satan should take advantage of us. This is how he comes in. For we are not ignorant of his devices. If one of his devices is to send, to allow you to harbor unforgiveness and hatred and bitterness in you, it will come in and devastate you because you have broken the seal with which you are sealed until the day of redemption. Number eight, spiritual timing. Spiritual timing. Accurate timing is the key to spiritual breakthrough. The Bible makes it plain that our times are in the hands of God. He is a true timekeeper. Don't look at what is happening to your brother who is making progress and then you get uh, angry or to your sister who God has favored and you, you are, you are, you are Scheming? No, don't do any of sort of things. When your time comes, even the elders will not sit until you show up. All the brothers of David were paraded before Samuel, but the Lord did not choose any of them. And they said, there's still the eighth one. They said, bring him forth, for we will not sit down until he comes. They were standing already, but they had to stand again to welcome him in. When your time comes, you will not have to push, you will not have to chill, you will not have to make noise. People will recognize you as you walk in because you come in in an acceptable time. Look with me in Psalm 31 verses 14 and 18. God is our timekeeper. Listen to David. But as for me, I trust in you, O Lord. I say you are my God, my times are in your hand. When you know that, that your times are in your hand, no matter what you are going through now, God will step in. He says, deliver me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. Make your face shine upon your servant. Save me for your mercy's sake. 
Our times are in the hand of God. Do not let me be ashamed, O Lord, for I've called upon you. Let the wicked be ashamed. Let them be silent in the grave. Let the lying leaves be put to silence, which speak insolent things proudly and contemptuously against the righteous. And when people are speaking ill of you and, and, and cheering you, your, 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 uh, your personality, your ability, your all in confidential whisper, tearing it down, is because the time has not come. When that time comes, no dog will wag his tongue. Our time's in the hands of God. When Joseph was going through trial, it looked extremely painful. But his brothers eventually came and prostrated before him three times. According to what God had showed him. Wait for God. Wait for your season. Wait for your time. The book of Daniel contains this strategy of Satan deployed to persecute or wear out the saints. Brothers and sisters, whenever we key into God's timing, we experience significant breakthroughs. But when we act outside of God's timing, God's timing, we play into the hands of the enemy. See how the enemies attempt to, or attempted in the days of Daniel to change time and season. He will attempt to change time and season by urging you to go ahead of God when it's not yet time or to procrastinate and lag behind when it is time. That's the way Satan wears people out. Daniel chapter 7, 15 to 27. Daniel 7, 15 to 27. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near to one of those who stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. Those great beasts which are four, are four kings which arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom. That's their destination. That's where they are going. The kings, the, most, the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. And I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, with teeth of iron and his nails of bronze, we devoured broken pieces and trampled the residue with his feet. And the ten horns are on his head, and the other horn which came on before which three fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous things, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints. Wow. He was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. How does Satan come in to defeat and afflict God's people? He was waging war, prevailing against them. Until, well, when the timekeeper shows up. Until the ancient of days came and judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. And the time came. That's the a, that's a key there. And the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. He has said they shall possess, but the time came for them to possess. Thus he said, the first beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth we shall be different from all other kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth, trample it and break it in pieces. The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom and another shall arise after them. It shall be different from the, the first one and shall subdue three kings, leaving only seven. It shall speak pompous words. How? It shall speak pompous words against the Most High. It shall persecute. In the King James Version, it says it shall wear out he shall persecute the saints of the Most High. How? He shall intend to change times and law. And when he intends to change times and law, and you fall into his lawlessness, and you do not keep accurate timing, you are in a hurry, you are impatient, <laughs> and shall intend to change times and law, then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and have a time. Timing is the issue. But thank God he will not defeat us because the court shall be seated and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever. Hallelujah. They shall take his kingdom and destroy it forever. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him. People of God, we need grace to obey God implicitly and the voice of His Spirit promptly. To go and run ahead of God in transgression 
or to lag behind his accurate timing due to procrastination is like looking for manna outside of God's timing. That is an exercise in futility. When you begin to look for manna outside of God's timing, you labor in vain and bring forth for trouble. You walk like an elephant and eat like a nun. Give me Exodus chapter 16, verse 27. Exodus 16, 11 to 27. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, I've heard the complaints of the children of Israel. Speak to them, saying, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God. So it was that quails came up at evening and covered the camp. And in the morning the dew lay all around the camp. And when the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a small round substance as fine as frost on the ground. So when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? That's the meaning of manna. What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, This is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. Angels' food rain down from heaven. This is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Let every man gather it according to each one's need. One omer for each person according to the number of persons. Let every man take for those who are in his tent. Then the children of Israel did so and gathered some more, some less, according to each person's ability. So when they measured it by omers, he who gathered much had nothing left over, and he who gathered little had no lack. Every man had gathered according to each one's need, not according to each one's greed. And Moses said, let no one leave any of it till morning. Other one, don't leave it till morning. Notwithstanding, they did not heed Moses, but some of them left part of it until morning. And he bred worms and stank. And Moses was angry with them. When you should consume and you do not consume, it's going to breed worms and tanks. When you should keep and you should not save, you do not keep, it's going to affect you at the same time. It's called vicious, of, vicious cycle of poverty. We do not have because we do not invest, and because we do not save, we do not invest because we do not save, and we cannot save because we do not invest. So they gathered it every morning, every man according to his need. And when the sun became hot, it melted. And so it was on the sixth day that they gathered twice as much bread, two omas for each one. And all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. Then he said to them, this is what the Lord had said. Tomorrow is a Sabbath rest, a holy bath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake today and boil what you will boil and lay out for yourself all that remains to be kept until the money. So they did. Laid it up this morning as Moses commanded, and it did not sting. Now were there any worms in it? Why? They followed the instruction. And they said, don't keep it. They kept it. It stank. It bred worms. They said, you can keep it now because tomorrow is Sabbath. You are not going out to gather anything. That's forbidden. Don't go there tomorrow. Then Moses said, eat that today, for today is a Sabbath for the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day the Sabbath, there will be none. Now it happened that some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather, but they found none. See, it's as simple as that. When you came to God's instruction on timing, everything you need will come. If you seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, all other things shall be added unto you. In the name of Jesus, may God grant us grace, exceeding grace, to key into His timing for whatever and no matter what it takes so that we can be absolutely free from the hands of the enemy. Give me Ecclesiastes, chapter number 8, verse 4 to 7. Ecclesiastes 8, 4 to 7. Where the word of a king is, there is power. And who may say to him, what are you doing? He who keeps his command will experience nothing harmful, and a wise man's heart discerns both time and judgment. Because for every matter there is a time and judgment, though the misery of man increases greatly. For he does not know what will happen, so who can tell him what it will occur? May God give you a discerning heart to know what season we are in, in Jesus' name, and to key into all that God is doing. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 11 and 12, or 11 to 12. I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to men of understanding, nor favor to men of skill, but time and chance happen to them all. For man does not know his time, 
If a man does not know his time, what will happen? Like fish taken in a crow net, like birds caught in a snare, so the sons of men are snared in an evil time, redeeming the time for the days are evil when he falls suddenly upon him. May God grant you grace to key into God's timing. I declare it is our time, it is our chance, and the enemy will testify in the name of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the complete package of our redemption, both in its legal and vital aspects. We ask in the name of Jesus that you would deepen our understanding of these principles so that we will not fall victim of the schemes and the wiles of the devil. We thank you for grace to walk in 100% victory over the forces of darkness 100% of the times. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen.